Hello. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Yeah, as, um, as I said, we, we are actually in Northumbria University, so in Newcastle BIM Academy. I work for BIM Academy primarily looking at BIM for FM, but today I'm going to present about uh, the competitions that we've entered, So, uh, and it's through that. And the paper was really about the difference between um, a fairly traditional process in the sense that people were working in silos and then uploading their, their information, and then we were we were disseminating that through that. So. Uh, and then versus a, a very integrated process that we did in Build Qatar Live, which is the second one, where everyone was co-located in the same location uh, and everyone was looking um, at working collaboratively through that. Um, I'm going to focus the main, the main bit of the talk on uh, Build Qatar Live and try and distill what we did through that and, how that, and then I'll compare that at the end. Um, I think it's really important to note that this was all about the process. Both of these both of these competitions were BIM integrated competitions. Um, so this, this paper is all about the process and how that how actually that is really important within within BIM itself. So I mean on that note, um, yeah, BIM is a BIM is more of a process than a than a um, than a software. It's a it's a way of working. The softwares are the enabler for that, but the, the BIM itself we we feel is is really that process and that and that new way of working. Uh, and this this picture is a from the Build Qatar Live in the sense that we're doing a design review there uh, with everyone working around the same table and, and ch all chipping in. That's not just designers up there. In terms of the competitions, um, Rider Architecture actually started in uh, 2009 with a, with a Build London Live. Uh, BIM Academy came on board in 2011, were well, formed in 2011, should I say. Uh, we did two, um, two competitions that we compared on, on this paper, uh, Build London Live and Build Qatar Live. And then we've just two weeks ago just completed Build Sydney Live, um, where we won the, the full award. And, and it's really important to take that those lessons moving forward. And we're still we're still taking those lessons going forward. Um, in terms of the first thing we did on on Build Qatar Live, is we created a, um, a a BIM execution plan, and this gave real shared understanding of what we wanted from every stakeholder on that project, uh, and moving forward all the way through the 48-hour period. When we moved on from that, we had a design review where we looked at um, what the design was going to be for the project and looking at the, looking at the brief we were given through, um, through to what we wanted to do with that project. And, and I think the most important thing for us on that, with the co-location of everyone in there, was the fact that we could actually start mass modelling the building whilst we were designing it, whilst architects were sketching it. We could go out there we could sit there and we could mass model at the same time. And that brought everything real, um, quite, quite um, forward quite a lot in terms of how we were doing things. It meant we had information about floor areas, size, the site, and all this could be started to be fed to the QSs and to the other um, modeling teams within that. It also allowed us to put the, um, put the model into, or put the design into context. We can move that mass model straight into the context of where it was in Qatar we could, um, so instead of the uh, designing the building, putting it into context, seeing if it worked and then changing it, we could put it into context immediately with that mass model and, and trying to understand that where we were. And also at this stage we could feed that mass model to the m &E guys, to the structural guys and to the landscape and get them to start working as well at the same time in that collaborative process. As well as this, we um, started a, the cost model at a very early stage, applying a generic cost management map to the, to the project. Uh, and at the end of 24 hours, we produced an initial feasibility study uh, based on the developing design with robust, robust benchmarking based on the size, number of floors, and locations that we took from that mass model that we did at the start. Something else we did with the mass model, whilst people were, um, whilst people were working on their developing their designs were some of the analysis tools that, that are out there. So whether that's the environmental tools, the volumetric, the structural, cost analysis, uh, also carbon analysis here as well. Um, and bringing this, bringing this analysis forward informs the design at a point where decision making is much more flexible and much more, um, it's much easier to change and much more effective and much more efficient in terms of a cost as well. Um, one of the tools we used in there, which was something that Bath University in Northumbria worked on, was iSIM, which was looking at carbon, man uh, carbon um, offset, which was looking at a tool that, 
that told you, based on your mass model, how much carbon offset you had within that building. Um, and with that, you can move forward with a, a much more confidence that you're creating a building that has um, carbon efficient materials within it. Something else you could do at a really early stage was um, plan the strategy of the building, understand um, the workflows, understand the movement of the building, understand how it all fitted together, how it worked together. And this all could be done at a quite an early stage with, with a relatively developed model, but not, I mean, it isn't, it's, still a, it's still a mass model at this stage, it's still not a developed design, but you can still work out this strategy in terms of, in terms of how things move forward. Something we did when um, the models were at a certain point is we started to federate the models, started to put them together, started to try and understand um, how they worked it together in that, in that collaboration, in that understanding. So instead of working in those silos like we might have done before, take a couple of weeks to design and then push them all back in, there was this point where we could, we could put them together quite early on and, and then to talk about these clashes and then report that back and go away. Um, and correct them with, with the federated model already there. And then another thing this allows us to do at that time was on this we could upload that to ASITE which was the um, common data environment at, um, on this competition, on both competitions. And um, this allows the client to check it at that stage, check the process, check the, uh, the progress, sorry, of that. Uh, and it also gives an audit trail in terms of how it's progressing through that, through that stage. So once it's federated we looked at um, how we could check that model, how, how we were looking at the data clashes. So in this sense we put it into um, Celebri Model Checker, there are other ones out there. Um, and this allowed us to do both hard and soft clashing. So hard clashing is when you're looking at the geometry, when the geometry intersects, whether that's ductwork or um, pipe work through walls or doors or anything like that. But there's also soft clashing which is really interesting in the sense that you can um, look at access or clearance issues and put swings on doors and understand maintenance areas around ducts and this is some of the information that you can really gain at an early stage through that. Uh, some of the other uh, rule validations that we put on Celebri and some of the checks we did are, are up there in terms of trying to understand um, what, we could, what we could do and, and, and how we could improve the design at that really early stage. Um, so, I mean, some of the benefits are up there in terms of, in terms of what it is for, for all the different stakeholders within the process, but we're looking at um, the design team allowing a relatively fast way of checking the inaccuracies in the model. You've got the cost consultants who can, who can receive a, a more accurate model due to this model checking. Clients have got a level of accuracy and identify. Um, it also improves their, the confidence they have in the model and understanding it. So model checking was a real important part of, of what we did on, on, on this competition. We did some other analysis in terms of um, open source pedestrian analysis, in terms of understanding where pedestrians would go in the building. We also did structural analysis, daylight uh, factoring. Um, and lighting levels and, and there were all these all these analysis and all this software enabled us to collaborate at an earlier stage and also talk about it and understand what we were what we were wanting to do and what we were pushing forward through. Another thing we did within this competition was we it was the first time that MBS got involved in terms of creating a spec at the same time as the models. So throughout the the 48 hour period we were looking at um, them creating three different specifications. The first one was looking at um, the performance specification, or the performance information, sorry, and then building up to scheme design, and then, um, and then building that further into a detailed specification near, near the end of the project. So stage one, as I said, was the specification, which was um, developed whilst the design team were um, developing their outline models and outline designs. Uh, the second one was the outline specification, where we could, we could populate um, detailed objects into the model. Uh, once those, once the design was was up there and was was developed, uh, and then we moved to a further stage of um, specification, the detail spec, where we um, we looked at adding more and more information into that and, and building that specification up through the process at the same time. And MBS were there as well, working in collaboration with everyone else. Uh, we also created um, Kobe exchanges, Kobe drops, as you like. Um, and these were just outputted throughout the project. We, we made a um, conscious effort to output three throughout the project. So a pre-drop, which was looking at roles and responsibilities. Um, data drop one, which was looking at requirements and constraints of the design. 
and then the drop two, which was the outside solution and the information that was held within that model. So we could, I mean, in, in 48 hours, we created five models, essentially. We created a, an architectural, a structural, a mechanical, an actual, a landscape, and a specification, all in 48 hours, all working collaboratively together, all pushing through that the same, um, with the same goal in mind. Um, another thing we did was 4D planning, so a simulation, looking at how it was going to be built through, uh, through the time, through its, through its um, construction phase. And then the cost also improved. And it wasn't a, a case of improved in terms of cost accuracy. It was, it was estimate precision and understanding, um, looking at uh, that estimate precision, looking at the information with, which was in that to understand that. Uh, and we also looked at that stage about life cycle costing and understanding how much this was going to cost through, through its life. We looked at reporting and I think in 48 hours to produce a report, any report, is, is difficult. But it was because the information was in that model and because we could, un, uh, we could take it from that, um, it allowed us to create these, these reports through that. And we also created visualizations from the model. So we didn't have to have a, an artist's impression of a model at an early stage. We could produce um, these visualizations and these renders within the 48 hours as well. So they were some of our deliverables within those 48 hours, and it's quite a, quite a comprehensive list in terms of what we did. Um, and we believe it, it was purely because of that collaboration and that, and that process that we went through that allowed us to create all, this, all, this, all these deliverables. So how does it differ from the first one, which we said was a bit more traditional, to the integrated collaborative one, um, project that we did second. It, and it was really, a lot of it was about co-location, but it was about communication and understanding uh, the lessons moving forward from Build London Live, which was looking at um, how everyone was working in silos initially and feeding, they were feeding information to each other, but everything was going through BIM Academy to a site and then back out. And there was, and that was that, um, it was that realization that actually we need to communicate throughout this. We can't just communicate at different upload stages. We need to co collaborate throughout. So the second time with Build Qatar Live was, as I say, everyone was co-located in, in rider offices in Newcastle. And um, it was that ability to talk to different people. So the structural guys could go and speak to the M&E guys. The um, architect could go and speak to, to whoever he wanted in the QS. Oh, that doesn't happen very often. Um, but it was that co-location, that ability to speak to each other at any time was really important, we felt, through that project. And a, co a couple of the comparisons in terms of what we did, and, and this is looking at um, our planned program compared to what actually happened. And with, with this integrated collaborative approach, we felt that the, uh, the actual program was stuck to much, much closer. Now, obviously, there's going to be overlaps in terms of what we're looking at, but I mean, it's a real striking difference in terms of the differences in, in how um, accurate the, the pre-planned pre uh, program was. I mean, and some of that might have been taken from the lessons we've already learned from, from doing the one previously. And workload as well, so design effort or design time. Uh, the top one is uh, Build Qatar Live and the blue one is, is Build London Live. And the, there was a real difference in in the design effort and where the design effort was uh, in the 24-hour period. So you get a, a, an element of, of effort before the, the design period. You get an outline brief. Uh, so you work up the program. You work out who's going to be on your team, et cetera, et cetera. And they were fairly similar. But actually, when you, when you look at it afterwards, there was, a real, there was a real difference in the amount of work that people could get on with to start with, but also that, that, extra, that extra peak in the Bill Qatar Live at an earlier stage and, and the fact that actually the, the workload dropped off much earlier because of the way that everyone could get together and could work collaboratively through that. And this um, also offered through the, um, through the planned outcomes and actual outcomes in terms of uh, the amount of, of stuff we could do um, compared to the Build London Live as well. So lessons we learned from it, it's in terms of forward planning, multidisciplinary work, uh, responsibility and capabilities, understanding that, but it, we really felt it was about the bottom three. Co-location is really important. Communication and collaboration are probably the two most important ones within that. And as we said, we took these lessons forward to build Sydney Live, where we had 63 
people based all around the globe, people in Norway, people in Australia, people in uh, England who weren't co-located physically, but we had everyone on Google Hangouts, Skype, everyone was talking all the time and that location and that collaboration was, was still there and it was still a lesson that we really took forward and really understood. Um, and we happened to win uh, the award for this one at the end and, and the lessons are still moving forward. Uh, and finally, BIM Academy have put this into a, a three-day CPD course where they're looking at um, creating a model within three days with, with stakeholders from industry. So we bring people in, um, we give them a project brief, we give them a, a BIM out execution plan, and they work through a project. And there's contractors in that room, there's architects, there's uh, cost managers, everyone. So whether that's from the same team or whether that's from various teams around, it's still trying to understand that process and we think that's really important if we're going to get on this BIM journey. Uh, and that's me. Yeah, this one is on. Um, thank you very much um, for that, Graham. Um, a couple of points stood out to me. Um, in that presentation, and I think that was very, very informative, particularly the whole issue of um, soft clashing. I think that's, that's excellent and that's um, um, a, a huge benefit. The idea of building the specifications alongside uh, creating the model, and the whole idea of co-location and collaboration, and that co-location, um, while, while it's better for collaboration, co-location doesn't actually mean sharing the same um, physical space, but the virtual space. Um, we take a couple of questions. Up the front here. Wait for a mic. Hi, James O'Donnell, UCD. I didn't see energy analysis in your list of tasks. Could you explain why that wasn't achieved? <laughs> um, it, it, was, it was probably purely because of the team members we had at the time. Um, I know uh, IES was used uh, on on competitions before, uh, and we have used it, but it was it was it was probably just based on the people we had, and it's it's absolutely something that we would do in a real in a real environment. Um, it was just something that we didn't have, and we we do do it on this the CBD course that we do as well. Great, I'm just intrigued. Did you go to bed at all? Or? Um, George, who co-authored this, didn't, yeah. so he was up for a good 55 hours or something. Um, I did, I have to admit. Uh, you did, huh? Yeah, I did. But there was a few people who didn't go to bed. And, and obviously this isn't real life, and, but it, it's, a way of, it's a way of fitting it all into a very short space of time. We're all very busy in what we do in everyday life, so to do that in 48 hours. And it does tend to immobile people for a few days afterwards, but it's, it's more than worthwhile. Just for waiting for the next question, just a, a tweet I noticed on the floor um, is that um, uh, Bill Qatar Live um, designs in Doha bring back memories of lack of sleep. Okay, <laughs> guess who that's from? Um, um, where's the microphone? Sorry. Okay. Hi, Malachi Matthews, DIT. Uh, fantastic presentation. Absolutely wonderful. And um, we spoke earlier today about the, the social side, the human side of building information modeling and uh, uh, fantastically emphasized in your move from the London project to the Qatar project in terms of the co-location. And um, I know you've emphasized it again, but in your, in your personal experience, are there a couple of uh, indicators that you could give us in terms of the co-location and how that helped the project? Yeah, it was, it was the instant access to people that you needed to speak to. It wasn't the fact that you had to email them or, I mean, especially, it probably was even more apparent on the Sydney project where we had guys in Melbourne and Sydney and New Zealand uh, and we in North, um, well, in Ryder in Newcastle were talking to them by a virtual link, like almost, almost all the time in terms of what we were doing and we'd have design briefs through that and design... And I mean, that's, that's enabled by the, by the um, technology, but it's, it's something that was really apparent is the fact that you can just speak to people all the time. It's not that, oh, he's in that office, we'll send him an email, we might get one back in 20 minutes' time, he might be busy with something else. It's the ability to, to go and get your answer immediately. And it was that, 
that collaboration and understanding that everyone was building it together was, was really important. I think there's, there's certainly a lesson to be taken out of that in terms of the way we go about our business and the way practice is currently structured, uh, the way you've got the architects in one area, you've got the engineers in another area, the quantities of errors in the most expensive area of course. <laughs> and, um, but that idea, thinking that they're collaborating by telephone, by email, that's not really happening and that's, yeah. that is something that has to be addressed for firms if they are serious about taking on building information modelling. I would yeah, suggest. absolutely. And, and something to be said, uh, Ryder are obviously fully behind what we do with these competitions and they're looking at that potentially as an initial kick-off design review with clients. So bringing the whole design team into Ryder offices as an initial design review and getting that collaboration at an early stage. And I think it's, it is something that we'll, moving forward might be really important within the, within the industry. Okay, any more questions? Okay, thank you very much, Graeme. Cheers, thank you.